braving the elements and the presidents to make it here tonight and joining us for the second half of our 40th season of River Sticks and our third season of River Sticks here at the Tavern. Um, this evening we are featuring two poets who coincidentally grew up here in St. Louis, Catherine Nuremberger, who will always be caged to me. She was one of our very first interns, by the way. I don't know if Kimberly put this in her introduction. I did not. It makes me feel really old. She also used to babysit my kid, who's now like 20 in college, so. Anyway, and then also George Bilger, who's kind of a St. Louis native-ish. He probably won't claim it anywhere but St. Louis, but he is. We claim him. Both writers have books for sale, courtesy of Left Bank Books, along with the latest issue of River Sticks, our 39th anniversary issue, Who Wants to Turn 40, right here. Um, what else do we have? We have um, snarling dog stickers, which you can stick, you know, on your bumper sticker or your stop sign or your alley or dumpster to scare away the Philistines. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, oh, we have poetry contest flyers. Should you want to enter this year's poetry contest, judged by no other than Andrew Hudgens. And then we also have these schnooks cards. Have I talked to you about these schnooks cards before? I probably mm -hmm. have. But for those of you who haven't, if you get one of these schnooks cards and you sign up with Lizzie, our managing editor, who's right over there somewhere. Also has some people for money right now. Right, uh-huh. <laughs> um, she can hook you up with one of these cards. And every time you go to schnooks, and why wouldn't we go to schnooks, right? We all have to buy groceries. Then one percent of our profit, their of their profits, not yours, their profits go to River Sticks. Wow. It doesn't cost you a damn thing. So if you haven't got one of these yet, please do. It's free. Um, all we have to do is hook you up. All right. Is that all my business? I think so. Okay. Um, also, since we are recording this reading and uh, posting it on the internets, don't forget. To um, do this, and turn this off, because you don't want to look like a philistine on the internet. <laughs> I don't know. You could look like a Luddite too, I guess, or a Nimrod. Um, let's see. All right, and now at this point, I would like to introduce the co-director of our reading series, as well as one of my dearest friends, Kimberly Lazan. rag and bone. Liberated through thought and word, a universe of bodies, family, religion, nature, and music expands and explodes, the echoes of life and death leaving us to reflect upon our own most important questions. In the poem, The Fawn, a girl finds out that the old skeleton in her elementary school classroom might be that of an Indian boy, an untouchable and our poet writes, the body is not the person, but it so clearly is. Staring at this boy relic, I want to feel the calcified echo of his living pain, but the mind can never hold still. Catherine's poems remind me of the words of Rushdie. A poet's work is to name the unnameable, to point at frauds, to take sides, start arguments, shape the world, and stop it going to sleep. Catherine Nuremberg's poetry collection, Rag and Bone, won the 2010 Elixir Press Anti-Venom Prize. And her book, The End of Pink, is forthcoming from BOA Editions in 2016. She's an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Central Missouri, where she also serves as the director of Pleiades Press. And her book, Rag and Bone, is available for sale right out there, and I'm sure she'd be happy to sign one for you after the reading. Please welcome Catherine Nuremberger. I 
Richard and Kim for having me here, and for all of you for coming. It's such a pleasure to be on this side of the microphone in St. Louis. Um, I'm also very excited to be reading with George, um, George Bilger, whose work I've admired for a long time, and I'm really glad I don't have to follow his act. <laughs> and I want to thank the Tavern of Fine Arts for hosting us tonight. Am I doing okay with this microphone? It's, it's intimidating. <coughs> so, um, I have a couple poems about phobias, and I like to start with these because um, I get a little nervous with the microphone and the people, and um, it's all going to look like, uh, oh, she's like being awkward on purpose to express the feeling of the poem. So this is called, <laughs> see, totally on purpose. <laughs> you are afraid of the dark. You are afraid of the dark for which you blame the raccoons, or more to the point, your father who took you and your mother into the night with a flashlight and shotgun, then left with both while you held her shaking hand. You would follow your father to the end of the world, those distant birch woods where raccoons rustle and flash their green eyes. His gun was firing into the persimmon trees and the rain of leaves and ripe fruit fell farther and farther until only the crackle of his shots and the distant bang of the hounds could be heard. The raccoons came then to hiss all around. He left you, he left you and now you are ours. The next poem I'm gonna read is called Ichthyphobia. Ichthyphobia is the fear of fish. Um, <laughs> also, this takes, this, this sort of setting of the poem is the Shaw's Garden, so it also embodies the very peculiar new fear I'm learning, which is the fear of giving poetry readings in your hometown. <laughs> <laughs> Where everyone thinks you're Katie Nurberger, that weird girl from high school. <laughs> and, um, Anyway, so we'll see how that works out. <laughs> Ichthyphobia. Two of the bad girls from the neighborhood got drunk, climbed the fence into the botanical garden to skinny dip, and drowned. My brother... <laughs> I love it here. Out in the real world, nobody laughs at that. <laughs> My brother said the koi pulled them down. Their funerals were closed casket because of what the fish did to their faces. <laughs> this was at the pond with the zigzag bridge where my brother gave a push and said not to cry or be such a girl. The zigzag prevents evil spirits from giving chase. Evil spirits like the kappa, who is the size of a 10-year-old boy. Sometimes he sucks the flesh of a girl, her shoulder, her wrist, a nip, and sometimes he sucks her whole life out with heaving breaths. Don't believe? Play a game of pole finger with the face swimming in the water and just see if he doesn't drag you in. <laughs> For a quarter, we could feed the koi breadcrumbs, which is how they grown to the size of possums. I threw the pieces quickly and looked away from the clamor of fleshy pink yawns jostled by waves and slick bodies, but still felt the fish set upon my skin, mouths everywhere, dark water closing in. If the kappa has stolen your daughter, there is little to do. But if she is your precious daughter, your only one, Try carving her name into a Yubari melon. The kappa may make the trade, or he may keep both fruits. According to Freud, the child who wishes to join society must repress the memories of infancy's unfettered genitals. The kappa never forgot. When he comes, your only chance is to bow and bow. He cannot resist your manners. Even though the crown of his head is an indented bowl, even though he knows it's the clear broth of his brain spilling into that cold, dark water and it's gathering fish. <laughs> you guys, I was thinking about not reading this one, but you're such a nice audience. I'm going <laughs> to read you the poem about sex ed from Catholic school notes. <laughs> uh, I went through a spell where I was um, really obsessed with uh, like uh, 16th and 17th century anatomical drawings, and... Um, <laughs> They're really poor at drawing women in a way that's sort of sweet and hilarious. So um, one of these guys' name was Juan Valverde de Amasco, and that's the title of the poem. Juan Valverde de Amasco, he is the anatomist most mocked by the experts for drawing a vagina that looks like an inverted penis. <laughs> it is the perfect example, they say, of cultural conviction triumphing over direct observation. <laughs> but I look at these drawings and think, Here's a man who believed in love above all else. We're lost for each other, and this is how the body should be. Of course, nothing fits together that easily. 
In sex ed, our teacher drew on the blackboard a face-shaped uterus with fallopian tubes and ovaries sprouting from it like feelers. She named the creature Peter the Bug. We were allowed to ask anonymous questions and she felt free to speculate. A guy who drank enough fruit juice probably would have punchy semen. <laughs> as a religion of mysteries, she was a paraplegic nun who pushed on a joystick to move her wheelchair up and down the aisles. The hallway of the convent were lined with her paintings of roses in bloom. When the anonymous question was asked, she told us she had once been able to walk. The homecoming king begged her to marry him. Why did she become a nun? I simply loved God more, she said, but wasn't ashamed to admit that once sitting in a pew behind a mother, a father, and their three children, I couldn't stop crying. I thought a lot then about leaving the order, but everyone lives with regrets. You're wrong if you think losing your virginities will spare you that fate. <laughs>
large pupils and a square face carved from a beef bone. I am deaf and eat no bread and drink no beer, Mr. Deaf used to say. Electrical spook would turn the lights on. You must come with me. Your pleas are empty, Mr. Deaf used to say. Electrical spook would turn the lights off. Be willing or I shall use force, Mr. Deaf used to say, according to Felix, who is very old by now or dead by now, but remembers well the games he played when his father was still around. Electrical spook would turn the lights on. So over the weekend, I went to see this show at the Contemporary Art Museum here in St. Louis, the Jesse Howard Show. It's a fine piece of uh, Jeremiah's, basically. They're just like these rants on plywood written by this folk artist from Missouri that um, she sometimes has like these sort of great doodles of owls and palm trees, but mostly just like a, a lot of rage. He calls out his neighbors in a, in a way that's sort of surprising, considering they like, would drive by these plywood signs. Um, anyway, so I thought I'd read my own personal sort of... Uh, bit of wing nut ranting. Um, this is called U.S. EPA Regulation Number 524474. Gene splicing the beetle-resistant Bacillus thuringiensis with a potato sounds surgical, but it's just a matter of firing a 22 shell dipped in DNA solution at the stem straggling out from the russet eye. If you're lucky, the hybrid sticks. Have you seen what can be done with tobacco and fireflies? Just for the hell of it, whole Virginian fields now glow under the passing flames. Salmon tomatoes clutch their fishy gloss against the pinch of frost. I think I'll give it a try. I have the gun you gave me. You said I'd feel better if I held it a while. I feel better, and I'm not giving it back. I'm firing shrimp into pigeons and dipping the deveined crescents of their wings in cocktail sauce. Thinking of you, I made peppermint termites to sweeten the swarm and larynx the rats with mockingbird calls. I shot scorpion tails into the fighting fish, and now I've made a bullet of me to blast into your amber eye. Will you come out simpering like a girl, eager to perform your vulnerabilities? Will you recoil at the sight of a baited hook? Or will I pass right through imploding flowers of viscera without having scratched a run on your double helix? I wager you could arch each disaffected synapse without even noticing me careening through about to hybridize the brick at the other side of your exit wound. Give a stone a language chromosome and it'll run with words like water. It'll announce in spray-painted letters that it hurts you, that it can't live without you, that it would rip out its own mortar just to think you might take a concrete crumb to jingle in your empty pocket as you remember what I used to be. So, uh, my dad's here tonight. He's not a poet, but he's a good sport. And uh, <laughs> right before we started, he was threatening to come up at intermission and grab the mic and do a performance piece about historic tax credits. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to, so, yeah, because he does, uh, I don't know what he does. He does things with money and old buildings, and they turn out pretty great. Um, so this is, so I spent a lot of time in my childhood inside of buildings that probably don't like way too much lead paint to be safe. <laughs> this is called The Abandoned House. Luck is a mean-hoofed beast, likes to catch you by surprise. The lonely girl in the manor began making wishes, which is how Luck was called down from the forests of the mountains and into the geometry of her estate. He crept to her keyhole and hung on every whispered word. If Luck comes to your house, you must be so careful never to say the name of what you love, or he will think you've grown attached. You must never call, even in sleep, for a quilt or curtain or sagging cellar beam, or he'll make certain nothing is left to name but shingles and tar buried in the weeds. I once kneeled at the door when he was at the other side. Any lonely girl can tell you how his eye in the keyhole grows darker and deeper until it becomes a thorn in your brain, begging blink. And if you blink at all, keyhole, key, brass knob, weather vane, chiffon skirt, combs of mother of pearl, mother, father, spotless painted glass, bluebells in the grass. The key in your pocket will rattle sirens as he skips you down the cracked concrete road. It's exactly what you wanted. You'll think yourself unfettered, but luck has driven one nail into the sole of your shoe, hooked the other end of his string to the broken teeth of the attic window. He'll never let go. Did you think that they'd take you back? Luck will want to know. Did you think they even could? <laughs> Just going to read you two new ones. Uh, this, let's see, uh, this poem is about Fat Boy. And I understand we're living in this world now where, where the youth don't know what the Weekly World News was. Um, but maybe you guys, most of you might remember the newsstands the girls
grocery store where you could get all your like uh, Elvis sightings information. Um, and there's also this recurring character named Bad Boy who was like a half human, half bat sort of character that had adventures and uh, terrified the populace. Uh, so this is mostly about that. Also, I guess because time marches on, I have to tell you that um, that Shelley, Percy Shelley, the great poet, you you might or might not remember the part where um, he drowned, and um, when he washed up on shore, his friends built a pyre for burning the body, and uh, they said his heart wouldn't burn, which I always thought was sort of a lovely expression of the passion of his poetry. So, so you need to know about Bat Boy, and you need to know about Shelley. Bat Boy washed up on shore. I have grieved Bat Boy. When I was a sophomore with a joint and a bad boyfriend, he was an urchin with spray paint and an underpass that felt like home. When my trip turned, oh shit, I could only see him black and white. Bat Boy took me to the gas station to walk the neon pharmacy of the candy aisle. Anyone would have cried to stare at the newsprint of his face, but he was the leather-winged angel of that place, showing me how every microscopic quadrant of my tongue was a different piece of molten fructose architecture. People who are depressed can't see colors as brightly. The blur of his fang teeth was probably hepatitis yellow, if I could have seen him clearly. But after that I got clean, because it seems you never get to go back to the first glittering rainbowed miracle of a gas station, and wishing for it newsprints your face and your insides. Bat Boy was gone a long time, undercover for the CIA in the mountains of Tora Bora, an American hero in the headlines, even if you couldn't see through the gray of his red, white, and blue bandana. I was busy organizing protests with a lot of colorful posters and tie-dye. He's not the only person I don't know anymore. When the paper went bankrupt, everyone became very frank about how it was all made up. There wasn't even a kook in the attic reporters went out to interview, just cynics with word processors. I thought I remembered one day buying a pack of Tic Tacs, white and plain in their plastic box, when I saw the cover where he washed up dead on the beach, and it was like when Shelley was found on the shore, and how they said his heart just wouldn't burn, waterlogged and smoking on the pyre, beating some untranslated palm. But actually, that's not true, so I looked it up again, and it was the merman I was thinking of. Bat Boy is without end. <laughs> he's looking up at the incoming drone. He's under the overpass, flashing his teeth. He's hissing in the static behind the news that a certain number of people are dead, and a certain number are wounded. And I wonder what we might say, were we ever to pass each other at the periphery of someone else's war or natural disaster? How we would talk if one of us were really there. I wrote this for my daughter. Um, I wrote it during a time when she was just learning to talk. She's like two or something and just starting to talk, but, um, but refusing to make any sounds that weren't animal noises, which was very infuriating to her. I'm like, do you want juice? And she would like hoot like an owl. And I'm like, how about milk? And she hoot. And mostly she just hooted. She had other animal noises, but she really was into the hooting. So this is a poem about, about that, I guess. It's called Whatever You Need. We had a field once, and I walked out into and listened for the owls, but if I heard them, and of course I heard them, I didn't know their sound to hear it. What is a ghost, but what was the unknown sound? If bats are the souls of men, owls are the souls of women. If girls who die unmarried are doves, a woman who has been a mother becomes an owl. Go to the woods and call to the owl for help finding your love. The woman made of flowers was cursed into an owl. I lost them, the owls among the doves, as I lost the lace among the weeds and the hummingbirds too, and what was a bat to me for so many years but just another swallow? The woods were replete with owls I did not know. An owl will take a home's good luck with it. To avert disaster, if you hear an owl call in the night, you must return the call. To avert disaster, if you hear an owl call in the night, get out of bed and turn over your left shoe. Souls of penitents fly to heaven, guised as owls. Men whose deaths lay unavenged pace the night, guised as owls. The owls are beautiful or terrible, depending on the sky overhead and your own personal sky. They eat your just-clipped fingernails. They eat your newborn babies. A cow scared by an owl will give bloody milk. The owl had a skinless fledgling in its beak. The limp sack of belly was glistening crimson. Or so small as like a pendant of glass. I don't know what kind of sky it is I have that makes it so. It's very blue and without owls utterly drifting over the hay, which is golden as heaven is the word for no place I can point to. I went out into it in the night, listening for the owls that know the way. Every tree was a goat crying, not yet weaned out here in the milkless shadow of the woods. Which of these is the mist of the owl passing into something else? If you cannot call back because you are mute with the marvelous, unrepeatable thunder down hunting, Take off something, your shirt sleeve, and put it on inside out. In this way, the owl will not burrow into your chest and dance bad luck on the graves in your field. 
In this way, it is a charm to carry the heart and right foot of an owl under your armpit. In this way, it is medicine to drink broth of owl's eyes, gelatin, gelatin of owl meat. In this way, it is a binding to nail an owl to the barn door against lightning strike. You can frighten owls from the field by walking the land naked, hooting like you've ever yet heard them, or even if you haven't. The owl gave its fire in exchange for feathers. Like lightning, the owl brightens the night. Like a drum, the owl breaks the silence. I don't know how to call them down. Thank you all very much. Should I turn this up? Turn up. Oh, Jesus. All right, we're going to start, people. Thank you. So, and by the way, thanks again for uh, reading Catherine. That was a wonderful reading. I taught her everything she knows. So when I first received a copy of George Bilger's newest collection of poetry, Imperial, I was surprised at how many of the poems I knew. And not just because so many appeared in River Styx. <clears throat> But also, every time one appears in Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac, which is a hell of a lot, George sends me an email to check out Writer's Almanac. <laughs> every time. I, I've only been on there eight times, but George, like 80 at least. Uh, same with American Life and Poetry, and same with Poetry Daily. His poems also appear in Boulevard and 5 a.m. and numerous other magazines that cross currents with River Styx. There's no escaping George Bilger. But George's poems cover a very specific Bilgerian territory, which makes them not so much familiar as inevitable. Of course, George would write a poem about car salesmen and practically unopened Encyclopedia Britannicals on a card table at a yard sale. Of course he would write poems about coupons, garden hoses, busboys, and neighbors across the street being sent to nursing homes. Some things are funny because they're witty or crude. Some things are funny because they're silly or absurd. Most things are funny because they're painful or inappropriate and not supposed to be funny. George is funny for all these reasons, but his work is usually funny because it travels in the humor of the ordinary. The ordinary we pay little attention to and don't articulate, but that makes up every minute of our ordinary American lives. Again and again, George laughs and articulates quiet wonder at the world, laughs and scratches his head in understated dismay, or laughs and explains the poignancy of pork chops, our neighbors, the bad day at the office, and most importantly, our ordinary relationships with each other as human beings. In addition to being a poet and humorist, George Bilger is a radio host, a conversationalist, a eulogist, an excellent one, I might add, and I highly recommend him for your memorial service. <laughs> he is also a husband and a new father, not a former intern, but a former professional racquetball player. In the words of Mark Holliday, he is the cheeky nephew of Billy Collins and the brash blunt brother of Tony Hoagland. He is a traveler, a lover of good wine and beer, and even not so good beer. The recipient of grants from the Witterbinner Foundation and the NEA and the Ohio Arts Council. Oh, but for breath to utter what George is and what George is like. A professor at John Carroll University, the real and not always cheeky nephew of one of the most wonderful and interesting women I ever met the author of five previous poetry collections, according to Bill Coll Billy Collins, A Welcome Breath of Fresh American Air, A True Gentleman in a Most Ungentlemanly Age, and finally, A Good Friend. Please welcome once more to our podium, George Bilger. Just gone on and on. And on. <laughs> <laughs> 
There was really no reason to stop there, Richard. And it was so kind of you uh, and River Sticks to have me here tonight in St. Louis. You know, I was born in St. Louis, lived here until I was eight, and the family moved away. I came back and was a grad student here for a while, and uh, I love the city like no other American city. Um, I'm here every year for any reason. Uh, if you plan on dying soon, I will do a eulogy for you. Even if I don't know you very well, just give me a few notes, details. Um, um, you know, I think it's a good idea at, at a poetry reading. They're, they're, they're sort of egocentric affairs. You're up here and reading your own work and talking about your, your stuff. But I always think it's a good idea to begin a reading by uh, reading something by someone else, someone whose work was important to you and perhaps contributed to your own um, sort of coming to love poetry and becoming a writer. So I thought I'd begin tonight by reciting a poem by a poet who meant a lot to me when I was coming up. <clears throat> Another St. Louis and a fellow St. Louis and T.S. Eliot. And here is the poem. It is... Uh, the Wasteland. <laughs> Just read the footnotes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, okay, I won't do The Wasteland. Um, I'll do a poem by a British poet, uh, James Fenton, whose work I like a lot. And it seems perfect for this awful weather we're having. When life is dark, and all hope's gone. I think of you with no clothes on. <laughs> all right, and this really is kind of a weather-related poem. Um, I, I'm living in Cleveland now, and I mean, this weather here, uh, this is like a Hawaii to me. Um, Cleveland, it's been about 10 to 15 below zero, three feet of snow on the ground. And there's something about, I always get very excited when I know the temperature is going to go down to zero. There's just something about saying zero. It's <laughs> zero. And that's what this poem is called, zero. First it was five above, then two, then one morning, just plain zero. There was a strange thrill in saying it. It's zero, I said, when you got up. I was pouring your coffee, and suddenly the whole house made sense. The roof, the walls, the little heat registers rattling on the floor, even the mortgage. <laughs> zero, you said, still in your robe. And you walked to the window and looked out at the blanket of snow in the garden, where last summer you planted carrots and radishes, sweet peas and onions, and a tiny rainforest of tomatoes in the hot delirium of June. Yes, I said with a certain grim finality, staring at the white cap of snow on the barbecue grill I'd neglected to put in the garage for winter, and the radio says it could go lower. I like that robe. It's white and shimmery and has a habit of falling open unless you tie it just right. This wasn't the barbarians at the gate. It wasn't Carthage in flames or even the Donner Party. <laughs> but it was zero, by God. <laughs> and the robe fell open. <laughs> um, I live in Cleveland. I have a good friend, uh, my college, uh, college roommate, <coughs> my friend Dave. And uh, last summer this happened. And uh, well, I... It's just, sometimes it's really nice not to live in California. The poem is called Beautiful Country. When Dave calls from California to tell me his girlfriend is pregnant, it was an accident, but she wants to keep it anyway. 
although Dave's not so sure. He has his doubts. In fact, when he really thinks about it, not in this lifetime or in any foreseeable lifetime does he see himself actually becoming a dad. I realize the two of them are about to embark upon a long and dangerous pilgrimage through a wilderness called confusion, across a desert called pain, and down into a rocky valley called couples counseling. <laughs> They're x-raying their relationship like a couple of art collectors trying to figure out if the Rembrandt they bought last month is a fake. They're giving their love the third degree under a hot and blinding light, and by God, they better get some answers. Meanwhile, every day, that tongueless little sachet of cells is finding more and more articulate ways of saying, what about me? But I'm just strolling in my garden with a glass of cold white wine, watching the daisies wave their yellow flags from that beautiful country called Not My Problem. <laughs> Isn't that a good feeling? Yeah. I mean, it's so terrible for them, but you, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, so uh, something I'm looking forward to seeing soon and, and it can't come soon enough, uh, that one of the first great uh, harbingers, or as one of my students says, harbringers of spring, <laughs> is, uh, is when you're walking down the street in, in late April, early May, and you see hanging from the side of a house a hose. Right? It means it's over. Winter is over. People are going to start watering things soon. The poem is called Hoses. I love the hoses of summer, hanging in their green coils from the sides of houses or slithering through lawns on their way to the cool meditations of the sprinklers. I think of my father, armed with his scotch and garden hose, probing the dusk with water, the world in flames around him, booze running the show. Still, he liked to walk out after dinner and water the yard, fiddling with the nozzle, misting this, showering that. Sometimes in the hot twilight, my sisters and I would run in our swimsuits through the grass while he followed us with a cold beam of water. And once, when my mother came out to watch, he turned the hose on her. The two of them laughing in a way we'd never heard, a laughter that must have brought them back to the beginning. Um, you know, Richard mentioned, uh, a, I've written a poem about the Encyclopedia Britannica, and, and, and I have. Um, you think, uh, today you buy your, your MacBook Pro, and that's sort of the Encyclopedia Britannica of today, right? And for uh, people here who are, are my age, you remember that when uh, those GIs came back from, from the war, World War II, they were going to school on the GI Bill, and they came back and they, they got married and um, bought a house and a car. Their, their big goal was to give their kids something better than what they had. And uh, at that time, walking up and down your street would be these encyclopedia salesmen who would offer you something better than you had as a kid out on the farm. You want your kid to have an education, you gotta get an encyclopedia. Now my family, we were at, at the very, at the Rolls Royce level was the Encyclopedia Britannica. We were Collier's people. Uh, I don't know if there's anything lower than that, but um, what's, anything come below Collier's? World Book. World Book, yeah. <laughs> there's a World Book person over here. Yeah, so some of the, the you know, the, the landed gentry here, you probably had the Encyclopedia Britannica. But I was taking a walk uh, through my neighborhood last year, and I passed a house where they're having a yard sale, and I saw, I saw this. The poem is called Yard Sale. 
Someone is selling the Encyclopedia Britannica in all its volumes, which take up a whole card table. It looks brand new, even though it must be 60 years old. That's because it was only used a couple of times when the kids passed through fifth grade and had to do reports on the Zambezi River <laughs> and Warren Harding. <laughs> Der Führer was defunct. The boys came home and everybody got the Encyclopedia Britannica, which sat on the bookshelf as they watched Gunsmoke through a haze of Winston's. Eventually, these people grew old and were sent to a home by the same children who once wrote reports on Warren Harding. <laughs> and now the complete and unabridged Encyclopedia Britannica, bulging with important knowledge, is sitting on a card table in a light rain. Wow. Oh, wow. No one would even cover it, you know? It's, it's, it's totally worthless, totally worthless now. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from St. Louis. I was born here long ago. And my dad, um, I think a couple of people here might know this, my dad owned uh, what for a while was the biggest Chevrolet dealership in the city, Bill Gear Chevrolet, back in the 40s and 50s. And uh, the old uh, shop was across from the old sportsman park down in North Grand. So my earliest memories with my dad would be going to see uh, the cards play at Sportsman's Park. It was a wonderful memory. Uh, and uh, there, he actually did sell cars to some of the cards of that era, some of the players. There is a story that he sold a car to Stan Musial. And that's what this poem is about. It's called Musial. My father once sold a Chevy to Stan Musial the story goes, back in the 50s when the most coveted object in the universe of third grade was a Stan the Man baseball card. No St. Louis honky tonk or riverfront jazz club could be more musical than those three syllables rising from the tongue of Jack Buck in the dark mouths of garages on our street where men like my father stood in their shirt-sleeved exile, cigarette in one hand, scotch in the other, radio rising and ebbing with the cards. If Jack Buck were to call my father's drinking that summer, he would have said he was swinging for the bleachers. <laughs> he was on a torrid pace. In any case, the dealership was failing, the marriage a heap of ash. And knowing my father, I doubt if the story is true, although I love to imagine that big hayseed smile flashing in the showroom, the salesmen and mechanics looking on from their nosebleed seats at the edge of history as my dark-suited dad handed the keys to the man and for an instant, each man there knew himself a part of something suddenly immense. As when, in the old myths, a bored god dresses up like one of us and falls through a summer thunderhead to shock us from our daydream drabness with heaven's dazzle and razzmatazz. So um, this, I had a, a marvelous summer. I was on sabbatical this last term, and I, uh, this will come up a little later, but I'm, you know, an, the world's oldest uh, first-time new dad. It's not really a part of this poem, but we did bring, we, we spent the summer in, uh, in East Berlin on a project I was doing, and while we were there, we took various trips to other great European cities, and one of them was, was Rome. And I would like to, anyone here been to Rome? Yeah. yeah. I would like to share with you some of the magic and beauty of this ancient city, <laughs> also called the Eternal City. And uh, 
before I read the poem, I have to tell you, we'd been to a lot of great European cities by this point. So the name of this poem is Really Eternal City. Um, and we'd been there about five days and had seen one million things. <clears throat> this was our last day. After we'd walked for about an hour, heading toward the Vatican on a broiling August day, I began thinking about how long the tour we'd signed up for was going to be, and how many sacred things would be on view, and the immense amount of information the guide would tell us about all the paintings and relics and tombs and holy knuckle bones. <laughs> I knew it would all kind of just melt together in my mind and congeal into one big lumpen mass of suffering miracles and resurrections, <laughs> and gloomy old men in sandals. <laughs> and as I was thinking this, we just happened to be passing through a shady little square where a couple of bare-breasted marble nymphs were playing in the fountain, and there were no tour guides anywhere. There was no suffering or crucifixions. There were no complicated names or dates I would have to try to remember and the cheap red wine at the sidewalk restaurant where we ended up spending the afternoon instead of going to the Vatican <laughs> was wonderful, even miraculous, as was the spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> Somebody took me to uh, the big amusement park in, in uh, Ohio, in, near Cleveland, called uh, Cedar Point. And I mean, it, it was a, the middle of the summer, it was roasting, roastingly hot. I hadn't been to an amusement park for at least 30 years. And, and this thing was just, it was just a horrific experience. And I, I, you know, when I was a kid, and a lot of you can connect with this, amusement parks were actually parks. Green grass, shady trees. You'd go strolling down these romantic lanes in the evening. It was where I, I went on my very first date. Your whole sort of goal was to get um, that girl into the haunted house or the tunnel of love. Remember that? But now all of the all of that has been swept away. Now all you've got are these giant, really, I guess I would ex I would say phallic rides that point straight up into the sky and blast you up at hundreds of miles an hour. Uh, it's just a different experience. And so this, this poem is called uh, This Summer. The big dick rides have taken over. <laughs> the coat-soaked acres of great America. Now your death-defying one-hour wait is for big dude or the Tower of Power, or even the Magnum XL 2000. <laughs> Gone are the hokey thrills of yesteryear, the furtive, darkly vaginal ones, like the haunted house, which was really the tunnel of love, which was actually the haunted house. <laughs> They were too slow. They took forever. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned to you that I, uh, <clears throat> I'm this a new dad. And for the first time in my life, I, I'm now 63, so just a couple of years ago, I set about having a child. And you know, we, we all remember our wild and heady youth and those uncontrollable motion, moments of passion, but it's quite different to actually plot out having a baby. You know, it involves a sextant, a chronometer, a compass, you know, an exquisite sense of timing. And uh, I was thinking, you know, in many ways, planning this act, it's, it's kind of like an interview. And you are being interviewed by this being that doesn't even exist yet in order to be hired as parents, right? So I went online and I looked up interview tips. You know, they have all these helpful sites. So, you know, 12 tips for a successful job interview. 
And I wrote down some of these tips, and they kind of play into this poem. And for those of you who have planned this event, uh, I think you can relate. The poem is called Making Love to Make a Baby. It's important to be punctual. <laughs> Check the date and time. Check again. Take a long shower. Brush your teeth, floss. A little cologne probably wouldn't hurt. As for how to dress, this is one appointment for which casual is fine. A glass of wine wouldn't hurt. Be confident. Use appropriate language. Don't appear cocky. Once it begins, you realize that even though you've been through this a hundred times before, a thousand, this is the first time you're actually trying to succeed. <laughs> so just relax. Make eye contact. Don't mumble or chew gum. <laughs> even though the person who will hire you isn't even in the room yet, does not in fact even exist, appear enthusiastic. <laughs> Don't seem desperate. Just be yourself. Follow these steps, and chances are good you've got the job. <laughs> A lot of people here have been to, to it, are in college or have been to college recently enough to uh, be aware of this uh, page, web page called Rate Your Professors. Do you know this? How many people know Rate Your Professors? Many of you know, you can go, you're in college, you can go online and before you take a class, you can look at the professor and other students have rated his or her course according to various categories. Uh, helpfulness, usefulness, uh, preparedness. But the only category people really care about is the fifth one at the end. It's a little box, and the category is hotness. <laughs> and if the professor is hot, what do you get? You get a red chili pepper. And if you're not hot, you don't get nothing. There's just nothing in the window. So I was looking at my, uh, rate my professor's... <laughs> page uh, not long ago, and this poem came out of it. It's called Rate My Professors. I haven't even gotten to helpfulness or overall quality. What am I looking at? I'm looking at hotness, and there is no chili pepper. <laughs> Nothing. No matter how hard I stare, no red chili pepper appears under hotness. I sit quietly absorbing this. The hotness window is gray and cold as a winter day, as a snuffed candle. No zesty little chili is there to indicate that some, perhaps many, lovely young women were thinking about my dimples and dark brooding eyes my hands both strong and gentle as I turned the pages of Song of Myself. <laughs> Instead, they were actually thinking about Song of Myself. <laughs> Which I realize is the whole point, but... In a panic, I checked the ratings for my colleagues in the English department. <laughs> Jim, the nerdy rhetorician, he has a pepper. <laughs> Ditto John, the Miltonist, with his bad breath and absurd gray ponytail. Even Larry, the Victorianist, with his elbow patches, an infuriating way of starting every other sentence with, when I was at Harvard. Larry is hot. The last time I checked my hotness was five years ago. I was hot. And now the conclusion is, the inescapable conclusion has to be, I turn off the computer. I pick up a stack of student essays and begin marking them with, with a remarkably high number of A and even A plus grades. 
In the margins, I write many, many flattering comments. <laughs> oh, that's tough. Um, just going to read a few more poems tonight. This, uh, this poem uh, was inspired a few years ago when I was visiting my sister in California. And she said, you know, George, you're really getting pretty gray. Maybe it's time you started thinking about coloring your hair. And I said, no, no, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's, that's so hypocritical. You, you go down that road, there's no turning back. You know, you, you, I'm just not going to do that. And, and she kept nagging me about this. And I finally thought, OK, all right, we'll just do it. And we went down to the store, and we got the, the elixir. <clears throat> And I, I dyed my hair, and I just felt like a complete fraud. I felt sort of like a mortician for some reason. <laughs> and I, I spent the summer, and, and so I, I, never again, but I, I did get this, this poem out of it. And uh, my poem titles usually aren't very good, but this is an extraordinarily good title. <laughs> the title is Grecian Temples. <laughs> Because I'm getting pretty gray, oh, oh I, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt, I have to tell you one thing. The second line of this poem is really, it's a terrible line of poetry. It's a horrible line. It's not something I would ever write or even think about writing. Uh, it's a line, it's a direct quotation from my sister, all right? She's in business and this is how she talks, so don't tell me it's a bad line. I know it's a bad line. You don't have to tell me that. <clears throat> because I'm getting pretty gray at the temples, which negatively impacts my earning potential. <laughs> and does not necessarily attract vibrant young women with their perfumed bosoms to dally with me on the green hillside. I go out and buy some Grecian hair formula. And after the whole process, which involves rubber gloves a tiny chemistry set, <laughs> and perfect timing, I look great. I look very fresh and virile, full of earning potential. <laughs> but when I take my 15-year-old beagle out for his evening walk, the contrast is unfortunate. <laughs> Next to me, he doesn't look all that great. <laughs> with his graying snout, his sort of faded, worn-out dog look. It makes me feel old, walking around with a dog like that. It's not something a potential employer, much less a vibrant young woman with a perfumed bosom, would necessarily go for. So I go out and get some more Grecian hair formula. Light brown, my beagle's original color. <laughs> and after all the rigmarole, he looks terrific. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to win any friskiness contests. Not at 15, but there's a definite visual improvement. The two of us walk virily around the block. <laughs> The next day, a striking young woman at the bookstore happens to ask me about my parents, who are in fact long dead, due to the effects of age. They were very old, which causes death. <laughs> but having dead old parents does not go with my virile, intensely fresh new look. So I say to the woman, my parents are fine. They love their active lifestyle in San Diego. You know, windsurfing, high lie, a still vibrant sex life. And while this does not necessarily cause her to come dally with me on the green hillside, I can tell it doesn't exactly hurt my chances. I can see her imagining dinner with my sparkly, young-seeming mom and dad at some beachside restaurant where we would announce our engagement. Your son has great earning potential. <laughs> She'd say to Dad, who would take a gander at her perfume bosom and give me a wink, like he used to do 
back when he was alive and vibrant. <laughs> So I'm just going to read a couple of more poems. The night draws on a pace. Um, how many people here have won a MacArthur Genius Grant? Is it just me or anybody else? Okay, well, I won't read that one then. No, I, I have not uh, won one of these. Uh, they're pretty good things to win, though, uh, for, for two reasons. One. Um, the less important one, they're worth about half a million dollars. But I'm a teacher, it's not like I need the money. <laughs> the other is, the main reason is, all your friends have to call you a genius. And it's like, that would be the coolest thing, right? Like, my wife would, would be like, um, I thought you were going to take the garbage out, genius. <laughs> it's your time to change the kitty litter Genius. But no, it hasn't happened. But uh, actually, I came really close once, and that's what this poem is about. It's called Genius. It was nice being a genius worth nearly half a million dollars for the two or three minutes it took me to walk back to my house from the mailbox, the letter from the foundation trembling in my hand. Frankly, for the first minute, I was somewhat surprised at being a genius. I'd only published a couple of things at that point. I didn't even have a book. I was just a part-time lecturer at a small Midwestern college. But early into the second minute, I had fully embraced the fact of my genius. I mean, these guys know what they're doing, right? Who am I to tell the foundation it's business? And I was already rehearsing the modest hey, it's no big deal, tone of voice, I'd be using on the phone for the rest of the day as I called all my friends, and especially my enemies, <laughs> to share the good news. But when I opened the letter and found it was merely a request for me to recommend someone else to be a genius, I lost interest and made myself a ham sandwich. <laughs> Um, and I've said this before to budding poets, aspiring poets here, if you, you've got a poem uh, that just isn't ending right, uh, just use that last line. It will work in any poem. I made myself a ham sandwich. You can put it at the end of Paradise Lost, any poem. Um, just a good way to end. I'm going to read one last poem to you tonight. Thanks again for coming out and listening to me. And to Catherine, who was just a delight to hear. Um, this poem is uh, by request, and I, I read this poem the last time I was here, and I'll read it once, once again. A lot of you probably haven't heard of it. Um, years ago, many, many years ago, my, my first marriage, my starter marriage, ended, and um, it, was a, it, it was in 2000, and it was a traumatic experience for a lot of reasons, one of them being that uh, the, the divorce happened right at the end of the school term, and then I was faced with this huge gulf of three months of kind of nothing to do other than meditate on this failure in my life and this all-consuming sort of bleakness and emptiness. And it was a vital time for me because I thought the, it occurred to me, the only, I've, I've often talked at writing seminars and that sort of thing about how art can help you understand, art can make you whole, art can be a kind of therapy but it was really just the kind of thing I said. I never really believed it, you know? <laughs> just one of those things you say at a workshop, you know? I write to make myself whole. You know, people would take you to dinner. But, um, so I, for once I actually took that seriously and I spent the whole summer kind of writing my way through this uh, horrible, failure uh, of, you know, for which I, I took most of the blame, I have to say. So the poem is called What I Want, and it's dedicated to my marriage, 1996 to 2000. I want a good night's sleep. I want to get up without feeling that to waken is to plunge through a trapdoor. I want to ride my motorcycle in 
late spring through the meadows of the Rocky Mountains and lie once more with Cecilia in the summer of 1985 on a blanket in the backyard of her house in Denver and watch the clouds expand. And it would be great to see my mother alive again at the stove, frying up a pan of noodles into that peculiar carbonized disc that has never been replicated. I would like for my ex-wife to get leprosy. <laughs> Her beauty falling away in little chunks. <laughs> to the disgust of everyone in the chic cafe where she exercises her gift for doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> I want world peace. <laughs> I want to come home one evening and find that Julia, the new assistant professor in the history department, has let herself into my apartment for the express purpose of lecturing me on the history of lingerie. <laughs> I don't ask for much. A good Merlot, an afternoon thunderstorm cooling off the city as I sit listening to Ella Fitzgerald sing, spring is here, so the air goes lyrical, and perhaps a stray bolt of lightning strikes my ex-wife <laughs> as she steps from her car, setting her on fire. <laughs> to the unqualified delight of the friends she has come to visit, who are thoroughly sick of her self-aggrandizing stories. I want to spark a bowl of Maui Wowie and spend the entire afternoon in my dorm room with Corrine Spellman, trying to remember what we were talking about, wondering whether in fact we had had sex yet. I'd like to sit at the little outdoor restaurant by the lake and forest park talking with my aunt in the humid summer twilight as the hot St. Louis day expires upon the water and the moth-eaten Chinese lanterns glow like faded Kodachrome. We would argue about the great tenor voices of the century or causes for the dearth of poetry about the Gulf War or why my father drank himself into an elegy we never stop revising while couples on their paddle boats come in from the darkening lake as they've done since the beginning of time, and children call each other across the shadowy fields. Yes, that would be nice. I want a good woman with a sweet bosom and a wicked sense of humor. I want to wake up in London on a spring morning and read in the paper that my ex-wife <laughs> has received a lethal injection. <laughs> courtesy of the state of Ohio. <laughs> As part of a citywide program aimed at improving the civic pride of Cleveland. <laughs> but something has gone terribly wrong and she's been left in a persistent vegetative state, <laughs> which everyone agrees is nonetheless an improvement. <laughs> And it would be wonderful to sit down with Maria at our favorite restaurant in Madrid with some good red wine and listen to her Spanish caress the evening. I want to read that a new manuscript of poetry by James Wright has been discovered in someone's attic. And someone I haven't yet met, in some future I have yet to despoil, has bought it for my birthday. And after the kids are asleep, we sit out in the backyard a little drunk, and read it aloud to each other, something we often do in summer before climbing upstairs to the bedroom in the big old house we love so much. And uh, you're a very kind audience, and I just want to say, uh, I hope I don't uh, in any way come across as bitter in that poem. <laughs> that was part of the healing process. <laughs> Thanks again.
more time to uh, Catherine and Matt. We don't usually have two poets in one night, but I'm really glad we did tonight because they went together well and it was good to see uh, two old friends in St. Louis and here in one night. Um, next month, we have um, Jennifer Percy was supposed to be here, but she can't make it, so we have to figure out who we're going to have instead. Um, but we are going to have Fong Nguyen, who's a fiction writer um, at Warrensburg, so he'll be here, and someone who we just have to make up <laughs> between now and next month, so... It'll be good, though, I promise. Uh, let's see. Also, thank you to um, the Tavern for letting us do this for three years. And then also, thanks to you for coming and making this a fun evening, uh, braving the weather and the presidents. And hopefully we will see you next month. Oh, don't forget your schnooks card. Your <laughs>